Hello everyone, I'm Wendell Jones and welcome to this edition of our program, Jones and Company. On this program, we examine the national issues of the Bahamas. These are difficult times in the Bahamas in many ways and uh, there are many Bahamians who are struggling um, for many reasons due to COVID-19. And then, of course, the government of the Bahamas seems hard pressed in dealing with uh, many of the issues as well. And so, on our program today, we are going to talk about our country, the Bahamas, um, politically, uh, economically, and indeed socially. Our guest on the program today is the chairman of the Progressive Liberal Party, former cabinet minister, former minister of foreign affairs, and the current leader of opposition business in the Senate, Senator the Honorable Fred Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell, welcome again welcome. to our program. Great, great to be back. Great, great. Good to see you. Uh, how is Fox Hill? Uh, doing well. <laughs> um, I think people in the circumstances are holding their spirits up and mm -hmm. uh, leading the way and kind of demonstrating to the competent authority that you can still use the Fox Hill Park because there's still freedom of movement in this country, mm -hmm. notwithstanding these orders. Yes. And so um, in terms of, you know, the people in Fox Hill have always been uh, self-reliant. Um, uh, do you have a whole lot of social problems as a result of uh, COVID-19? Well, I, I wouldn't describe them as social problems. I think what is emblematic of in Fox Hill is what is uh, around the country, which is that there's so many people who have literally no food to eat on mm. a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. So there's have, there has to be a lot of social support and I was just speaking to the Minister of Social Services because there are enough cases around where people have been kicked off the social support programs of the government. They can't figure out why they've been thrown off the programs and they can't figure out how to get back onto the programs. And I asked him how is he going to address this because for someone who's uh, an activist like myself, you would imagine that people are at me all the time. You know, I don't have food to eat, my power is off, uh, things of that nature, uh, houses being taken away. But uh, what, you, what we'd put in place, the government of the Bahamas under Sir Lyndon Pindling and the kind of social revolution was this social support system in addition to national insurance which is supposed to help people through this uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. And people are complaining that they're just not getting uh, what they believe they should get. And of course, uh, my office is right above social services, so I'm the default position <laughs> when, anything, mm -hmm. when anything goes wrong. So that's a that's a major concern for me, is how to get food to people uh, in Fox Hill and uh, in other places as well. You know, the, the pandemic is going to continue for uh, a little while, I'm sure. Uh, and um, we have not heard exactly what uh, the government is uh, doing with respect to a vaccine. Do you know? Uh, there are some very long and torturous explanations. Essentially what they've said is that they're waiting on PAHO and the agreements with PAHO to deliver the supplies of vaccines that, uh, that they believe they're going to get. And they're thinking that sometime in March this, there'll be a delivery of these vaccines. Uh, the last figure I heard was something like 20,000 vaccines. Of course, that would be just a drop in the bucket. Uh, the other thing that the Attorney General says is they're trying to access uh, vaccines through the African Union and the diplomatic ties there. But it just seems to us uh, counterintuitive that for a population of 400,000, uh, entire population that wants to be vaccinated. And it seems like, uh, again, they've been caught with their pants down on these issues. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the people in Turks and Caicos Islands are receiving the vaccine now. That's right, and, yeah. And, and, and I mean, they're a much smaller population. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're related to the British. So they probably got through the British system because the other thing in the that is at work is that all these developed countries are now grabbing up all the supplies. So all of the agreements that PAHO and the World Health Organization made are being set aside to some extent because these uh, vaccines are being grabbed up by the development, developed countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, the uh, Prime Minister in the House of Assembly last Wednesday uh, he seemed to have had a difficulty with the Progressive Liberal Party having a, a committee or um, people to, to advise the opposition uh, with respect to COVID-19. What did you make of that? Well, you know, I've run out of adjectives to describe him and his behavior. Um, it's silly, ludicrous, he's uh, crude, uh, boorish, I mean, you can name all of those things. And the personal ad hominem attacks on Brave Davis, which is 
part of this propaganda campaign they have because they're facing a general election and they just have nothing to run on. Mm. So the idea is to pollute people's minds and, and make this the issue of Philip Brave Davis as opposed to running on their record of what they've done, which of course is not very much. Uh, as far as the committee is concerned, it is a normal, natural thing of any organization on something that important that you would have a select committee which advises your own leader and own leadership council about what the policies of the Progressive Liberal Party ought to be on that issue. And it was headed by two competent professionals, a number of other professionals, Senator, Senator Michael Darvill, uh, Dr. Melissa Evans, both experts in the field. Um, and it's about 15, 15 to 20 people, I think, are on this committee. And uh, they meet from time to time and discuss what their advice is to the leader of the opposition on what our positions ought to be. The party should have positions, and we've put those positions forward. Uh, what is interesting is that at every turn, uh, on the one hand, the prime minister says, um, you know, we ought to work together. But if you look at every public statement that he's made, there's always some ad hominem slimy remark about Philip Brave Davis, the first of which was, I don't listen to Brave. So after that, you know, everything is downhill. Uh, so we don't have too many kind things to say about him. Uh, he has not been uh, kind to us or to the country. And it shows in the results. He claims, he claims that, you know, they're, that they saved all these lives and that these people, you know, that there's not as much and people are following us and all that. But the pain and suffering out in the country is real. His government seems in criticism. Uh, they seem to be tone deaf. They seem to be living in a bubble. Uh, I just had a recent example of my back and forth with two ministers of the government over this matter in Freeport, which is vexing the population over there. You can't go one block in either direction before you run into a roadblock with police officers standing up with assault weapons on their shoulders for God knows what, uh, but essentially checking uh, really to write tickets for people. You don't have your identification. You don't have your driver's license. You don't have your insurance. You don't have your license. Uh, and there was a boast in one of the newspapers that um, the police were saying they wrote $395,000 worth of tickets I don't know over what period, over last, but it was certainly last year. So it looks very much like this is a government which is desperate for revenue. So those of us who know the Bible would be thinking of Pharaoh and how he just oppresses people or the Romans oppressing the Jews and just extracting taxes out of people at a very difficult time. And so you wonder what this is about. Anyway, the explanation comes back from these two ministers, the Attorney General and uh, Kwesi Thompson, the Minister for Grand Bahama, that uh, first the Attorney General says, well, uh, they're searching for firearms and drugs. I said, well, there's a case that Telford Georges did in the 1980s, and Telford Georges said, look, under our Constitution, you have to have a reasonable suspicion, notwithstanding the fact that you can search without a warrant, but you have to have a reasonable suspicion. And you can't reasonably suspect every car of having drugs and firearms. It's simply counterintuitive, and it doesn't work. So that didn't work. So the next thing they said was, well, uh, the F&M doesn't have operational control of the force. We, the, the air of that has long stopped. So this is now the PLP, you know, used to interfere with the force, which was rubbish. But so their claim is, it's the police that are doing this on their own, you know. So, you know, my response to this is, you know, pill, you know, just pin the tail on me because I must be a donkey to believe that. But regardless of the facts of, as they see it, the people in Grand Bahama blame the political directorate for what is happening. It comes off as harassment, it comes off as oppression, and it's just making it bad for them. So I said to them, you know, look, you know, you don't have to listen to me. Don't worry about it, you know, but you'll feel it in the end. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the way it is. Mr. Mitchell, the uh, opposition uh, took a position against the uh, continuance of uh, the emergency order. Um, there are many people who believe that this, the emergency order is needed, that the government has to have the mandate uh, to do certain things um, uh, in the country. The uh, Prime Minister went further to say that, you know, the opposition apparently uh, wants people to die or uh, want uh, people to suffer. Uh, well, what, what is your explanation as to why the, the opposition uh, does not want the emergency order to continue? 
Well, let's go back to the start of the pandemic. The only one that we supported was the first emergency order because we didn't know what the parameters of the uh, emergency would be. There was a scare throughout the country that illness, sickness, and death would follow if there, we did not clamp down immediately and try and stop uh, what appeared to be happening. The government said at that time that what they wanted to do was to use the opportunity of the emergency to ramp up the health care services, provide more beds, uh, more hospital space, more doctors. And in that time, uh, they would do that and then the emergency could be eased. But then they came back two weeks later and said they needed another one. We, eased, we said, okay, one more chance. Then they came back with a third. And then it just seemed to us that they were just getting used to the idea of pulling wings off butterflies, that they were just having fun with the whole process. Today it was 6 o'clock, tomorrow it's 7 o'clock, then tomorrow it's 8 o'clock, and then it's back to 3 o'clock. This business could open, the next business couldn't open. The one that, uh, that caused the argument in the House was the leader of the opposition was saying, how come the black businessmen over the hill had to close their liquor shops when the Caucasian businessmen out at Life at Key were able to keep their businesses open? So he went ballistic over that and all this business about uh, brave wanted people to die and so on uh, and, and making these uh, false assertions and arguments on that. So uh, at that point, we just simply said, look, enough of this. And people were our supporters and uh, generally the population was complaining about the weight of these uh, orders. Uh, what I compared it to in the Senate the other day was like the situation in South Africa under apartheid. You had this petty apartheid where you had to jump through all kinds of hoops to do the simplest, th simplest of things. And of course, the corresponding good, on the other hand, didn't exist. So we took a position that, that it went so far and we would go no farther with it. And that's been the position one time after the next. They have no plan except lockdowns and curfews. Uh, what you're seeing now is the general population, and this happens not only with this situation, but with other laws, which people just stop following them, and you just ignore it. I mean, the uh, funeral uh, regulations that they put in place are observed more in the breach than they are actually observed. So you had the situation last week with the funeral of uh, Ted Sweeting, where there was a spontaneous, it appears, march uh, with John Canoe. And the police say, when, when asked, the police were asked, why didn't you stop it? Why didn't you cite people? They said, oh, by the time we reached there, um, everybody had disappeared. So we couldn't find anybody on the scene. And that is what happens when laws become unenforceable. And so that's the point I think we've reached now, which is that it's just become unenforceable because people don't see the substratum for why it should exist. Mm. Um, and our alternative is that the statute law could do everything that you needed in terms of protecting the public health. So there was no need to put in place emergency orders which would suspend the civil rights of, of people in the country. And that's the other argument we had again in the Senate. The leader of the government says, uh, no, rights are not suspended, but I say rights are suspended. And he attacked the Nassau Guardian's editorial because they attacked the prime minister for saying that it was necessary to do this. Uh, we have an honest disagreement on the law. We say the statute law can do everything. They say they need to suspend civil liberties to do so and people are just getting tired of it. So, so um, if there is another wave, and we hope there is not another wave, um, and the government has to uh, have a lockdown, um, you need an, the emergency order to, to have a lockdown, don't well, you? Well, if, if they do need that, then they can go back to the governor general and get an emergency order. And I thought it was just fatuous, the argument made yesterday in the Senate uh, that um, you know, they have to go to the governor general and the governor general acts on his own deliberate advice and he may refuse to give the order and so on. I mean, give me a break. What rubbish. Uh, the fact is everybody knows that the governor general acts on the advice of the cabinet. And when it says, when it says governor general, it is the cabinet, in fact, that's making the decision. So that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. If the cabinet really feels that there is an emergency, then an emergency can be declared. But there is no evidence that there needs to be an emergency to do these things, which they have pointed out. Uh, they can all be done by the statute law, and that's our position. Are, are, are you 
that many people believe that there should be um, more consultation going on, especially um, since th this is a health crisis uh, that brought about an economic crisis in the country. Is there any consultation going on at all between the government and the opposition? Uh, none whatsoever. Um, occasionally, the prime minister and the leader of the opposition may have some off-the-side talks if they meet at a church service or across the floor of the house but there's no formal consultation which is going on on any of these measures. So essentially the government just does what it feels like doing and uh, it comes off as uh, ad hoc, uh, you know, from the seat of the pants uh, and it's just not making sense to the general population. I think the business community is screaming from the rafters because it has really choked off business. And let's put it this way, I, I said congratulations uh, during the past week to Joe Biden who's the President of the United States. And I think this provides a, an opportunity because the United States, I think where we are, all of us in the, the world, the region, our country, this thing is as out of control as it is because the United States abdicated its role as a leader in the world during the time that uh, Joe Biden's predecessor was in office. Mm -hmm. And I think people don't appreciate the extent to which the United States is such an important actor in every world body. Um, this is, for good or ill, uh, what I call the Pax Americana. I didn't invent the phrase, but essentially the United States, after the Second World War, constructed, along with its allies, a world order which essentially kept the peace, as we know it, for 75 years. Along comes one of their leaders, and he deconstructs the whole thing in four years. The result is the withdrawal from WHO left everybody scampering because people really depend on the United States for leadership in these issues. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, with this new man in place, and you know, coincidentally, he's, he always proudly tells every Bahamian he met, certainly told me, that he met his first wife here in Nassau at the British Colonial. Mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully, with a new man in place and with a, with a rational set of policies being put in place, we can bring this under control and then there won't be a need for third waves and all those kinds of things. Now, there is a bit of a, of a wild card because this virus appears to be morphing into various... Uh, Variants, yes. yes. And so that is an issue which we don't and cannot now appreciate. But again, I say the reserve power is always there for the government to declare an emergency if necessary. But I think that uh, the United States, once it gets its issues under control, and, and I've always said that because of our connection to the U.S. and the U.S. and U.S. Uh, interest in the Bahamas, it is very, there's very little we can do to shut the Bahamas off from the United States. This is the uh, vacation spot for the Northeastern establishment. Uh, Biden is now, Biden is from Delaware, so the Northeastern establishment is again in charge of the United States. Uh, this is a two-hour hop from Washington, D.C. for their vacations. Many of them have their uh, homes here. They're, even the Republican uh, moderate establishment have their vacation places here. And so it is uh, not going to be possible for the Bahamas to shut itself off from the United States. That is a, both a good and a bad thing. So it's good that they're managing the issue, but I expect that over the next year the situation will get uh, marginally better as the U.S. gets its situation under control. And I, and I say that because the main thing for our country, again, is to get U.S. dollars back on the streets. That's dried up, and, and until that turns around, we're going to have a real tough situation. So what this Bahamas government ought to be doing is figuring out ways to get U.S. dollars into the system. Yeah. Yeah. We, we are a third border of the United States of America, and uh, you have a whole lot of friends um, in uh, government in, in the U.S. Um, and in politics. You mentioned you spoke with the President, Mr. Biden, um, did you impress upon him how uh, uh, that we are a third border and the, the last um, order that he put in place with respect to uh, people entering the United States, uh, perhaps he should uh, allow uh, some exemption for the Bahamas? Well, my conversation wasn't a recent conversation, oh. I mean, not since he was elected. I mean, okay. He told us there was a meeting I was attending in Trinidad some years ago. So, but he, I've heard him repeat the story in public that yes. he met his wife here. Mm. But uh, that is something. We've sent a note to his office uh, with the congratulations. But I'm sure 
I mean, knowing him, John Kerry, for example, uh, likes Harbor Island. He's here all the time. He's back in the saddle as well. So all of these numbers we now have to start to use. But what I find is that the government uh, is resentful of this kind of uh, relationship which the Progressive Liberal Party has with these folk overseas. For example, uh, you know that Sir Franklin Wilson has a very close relationship with Maxine Waters, who's going to be a real powerhouse uh, now that things have changed around and the Democrats are in charge of the United States, both the legislature and the executive. Uh, so all of these uh, channels ought to be utilized to make the case for the Bahamas. I'm not saying that the Bahamas as an individual country has enough clout to influence a general policy, but I think that what has always made the difference is the fact that Americans knew the place or they know the place, and so therefore there, there is a sympathy which automatically comes forward when we say, look, this is causing us a problem. And uh, I think that that will inure to our benefit in, in the months to come. Let's, let's take a break here on our program. Senator Fred Mitchell, our guest on the program today. We'll come right back. Back here on our program, Jones and Company, and uh, we are happy to have Senator Fred Mitchell as our guest on the program today. And uh, at the break, we were talking about the relationship between the Bahamas and the United States of America. And um, as a former Minister of Foreign Affairs, when you saw what happened at Capitol Hill on the 6th of January, uh, what, 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 what came to your mind? Well, I, I, found, I just found it extraordinary because uh, the fact that, I mean, you know, first of all, let's go back to the campaign. I mean, remember the words that suddenly were being said on public platforms. I mean, this is just astounding that, that you know, the kind of language. I mean, we grew up, uh, both of us, in the broadcasting mm -hmm. uh, business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were just certain words that were just, you know, you just don't say those. You know, there's yes. a certain uh, public conduct. And all of that went out of the window. And then it just went downhill from there. But for uh, the leader of a country to stand up and have a full-scale physical assault on the system of governance which brought him to power was just extraordinary. And you could not help but um, compare uh, Trump to the situation in ancient Rome. You know the expression, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Right, yes. I'm not sure it actually happened, but the story is that he was on the roof as, as the city of Rome was burning, and he was busy playing the violin while the city burned. And it is a metaphor for uh, the situation we found ourselves. Here is this raging pandemic in their country, people dying on a daily basis, and here is a man who's just trying to get back to power, cling to power at all, and, and playing golf at Miralago instead of concentrating on the governing of the country. So I think it was a kind of welcome relief that the system, their system stood up to that pressure and hopefully they will learn some lessons from it. And I, I hope Bahamians also learn this lesson. You know, we keep saying, well, if we switch to a system like the United States with the checks and balances, that it would be better than the system we have. And I think what this point makes or should make to everybody is it's not the system, it's not the system, you can have any system you wish, but if the people who are in the system are craven, you end up with exactly what you saw in the United States, because the, this man could not have, have done what he did unless he was supported by people who simply put blinders on and just supported whatever he did and said it was fine, no issue. So I hope it tells people in this country that there is a time, and certainly these uh, MPs, members of parliament and senators, now who are getting up with this uh, craven, fulsome, slavish, embarrassing, you know, everyone has to get up, for example, in the Senate, these F&M senators, and the first thing out of their mouth is, I want to thank the most honorable prime minister for appointing me to the Senate. I mean, give me a break. I mean, what is this? You have a job to do. Uh, you were appointed to the Senate. But, you know, yes, he did appoint you. But presumably you got there because you had some talents and abilities which you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And it just comes off as uh, obsequious. And so uh, similarly, uh, as, it oper as they operate in the House of Assembly, the just no one dissents from, from you know, the, the, the policies which are inflicting harm well, the party and damage. Yeah. That's right. You know, you just do whatever the man says. 
And you know, Travis Robinson, who they had people had great hopes for when he joined the dissident uh, four that voted against the uh, the hike in the VAT rate, uh, has now gone right back to the situation, and you don't hear a peep from him. So that's so much for you know, go to the next generation. Mm -hmm. So I hope that uh, again, this teaches us about values and how we can uh, we should stand up for things which are correct and true to the extent that we can and that we'll be in uh, better governance. And as someone said, character matters. And when you look at what is happening with the Republicans uh, in the United States of America, uh, you have a congresswoman uh, who uh, supports an attack on the speaker, uh, Nancy Pelosi. And so the democracy is imperiled in America. And um, in addition to that, you, you have uh, some uh, senators and congressmen who are afraid to go to work. That's right. And, and what, is, what I found interesting on uh, the most recent uh, edition of one of the news stories in the States is that you need two-thirds majority to expel someone from the Congress. Yes. And they won't be able to get the two-thirds because people support, obviously silently support what she, what she has said. No matter how egregious the behavior. No matter how egregious the behavior. And so, again, you think of things, uh, how that translates. You know, uh, in the U.S. Embassy here, we've not had an ambassador in this country from the United States for 10 years, something like this. So the place has been run by public servants. And uh, I don't know whether it was the deliberate policy of the Trump administration uh, or what, but the public servants being in charge of the embassy has led, in my view, to an insensitivity and a lack of engagement with the Bahamian population. Uh, you and I both know from experiences with the United States Embassy when there was a political head here that there was a, an engagement between the Bahamian population and U.S. officialdom, which led to an easier relationship between the two countries. Mm. All of that is now cut off. And so the, one of the results is you hear these constant complaints coming from Bahamians about their treatment going into the embassy when they need to get uh, services like visa services, which are uh, valuable and important. And it appears that there is no redress when there is some wrong inflicted or alleged wrong inflicted on Bahamian citizens. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, they always, uh, what is always interesting is they used to have a liaison with us as a, as, a, as a political party, the major political party. But that is also very rare. There's mm -hmm. no relationship. So we have to use back channels as a political party to have some kind of relation, ongoing relationship with the United States of America. So I hope that, again, with the coming of uh, Mr. Biden, that that changes and that a political head comes to the U.S. Embassy here, which really fully, truly engages with the Bahamian population and the issues small though they are, which arise between our country and theirs. We say we have, um, our, our interests are similar. Let's talk about the quality of the democracy in, in our country and um, uh, whether uh, there is a growing appreciation for what we have. And there's a view, Mr. Mitchell, that uh, Bahamians need to be educated on our system. Uh, even uh, serving members of the parliament. Yesterday, um, I had the pleasure of hosting who I call my youngest friend, a two-year-old fellow, little fellow named Chosen Donald. He and his parents came to see me. Yesterday was his second birthday. And I've known him since he was three months old. And I told the story of a remarkable, remarkable to me, because I've not had the personal experience with it, where his father takes him almost everywhere. Mm. So uh, at three months, we were being taken through a tour of the Pinewood Gardens area, um, garden, public garden. And afterwards, we went inside. It was early in the morning, maybe 7.30 or so. And his father handed him over to his mother. And his mother, at three months old, the mother starts having a conversation with this baby. And the baby is looking up at her and responding to what she's saying to him, she's saying, oh, they, took you, they woke you up early and you haven't had your breakfast, so you're a little cross, and he's looking at her. And the nonverbal signs coming back obviously show that the child understands what she's saying and is responding to what, what the mother is saying. And it brought, it's just a small story which brings through the appreciation that you have for how parenting and training can make a difference in what a child becomes. So fast forward to the visit to the... Senate. I said to his parents, bring him to the Senate and bring him upstairs so we can take some pictures. And they came in and he, you know, he's two now, so of course 
I don't want to hold your hand. So he climbs the stairs by himself. And he goes up, and you know he's having a great time with all the big pictures in the big room. And it turns out that Dr. Mid Mildred Hall Watson, who is the president of the Senate, delivered him as a baby. So mm. she agreed to come out and took the picture. So uh, it was a wonderful experience. But the point of saying is not is just to repeat that experience, but also that they were. I wanted them actually to hear while I spoke about the event of meeting the little boy while I spoke on my feet. But they weren't able to do because they were outside the building. And I said, well, why were you outside? They said, I didn't know we could come into the Senate. And just a small <laughs> thing, you know, mm. people don't know that it's a public body. Mm. The House of Assembly is a public body. Yes. And that everybody has access to the building. And then they saw the pictures of all the royal governors. It was a magnificent place. They had seen it. A few people go there. But it's a small story again to um, support the point that you're making, that there is a need for teaching civics uh, or more civics in our, in our country. There's also a need for uh, the population to engage more in discussions with um, politicians and the public figures. So I find, like now we are beginning our canvassing door to door, I find that this is the most interesting period of the political cycle because people are engaged in talking about what you should do, what they think, what their feelings are, their attitudes are, and you get feedback from the population. Mm. Uh, we as a political party uh, attempted to resolve this problem by saying that there's a rule now that everyone who wants to apply for a nomination for the Progressive Liberal Party has to go through what we call a political module. And that module teaches you the history of the Progressive Liberal Party what our philosophy and ideology are, and also uh, the history of the Bahamas, um, some, some information on our institutions, how they work, and what is the role of a cabinet minister, how does the backbencher operate, uh, if you're the chairman of a board, what is your role? So that goes over four days, and, and most people have found it very exciting because many things they just didn't know about their country. Mm -hmm. I mean, people don't understand, I suppose, the extent to which there was actual racial discrimination in the Bahamas. And, you know, all of these things, of course, have largely disappeared. Uh, so it's been four decades or more since anybody experienced any of this. And so uh, there's a feeling that history began the day I was born. <laughs> and so that, that is something that we, that we try to counteract, of yeah. course. Uh, so that, that, that I agree with, and I hope that uh, going forward, many people have suggested in our platform that we ought to say that there ought to be stronger civics lessons uh, given in, in the school system. There are people who would agree that there has been a, a decline in the quality of representation that we have had in this country over the last um, few decades and uh, that the uh, number, uh, a whole lot of MPs uh, have not been properly trained or qualified uh, to serve. You are selecting candidates in the Progressive Liberal Party now. Uh, what, what are the qualities you're looking for? Well, first, that the, the basic, let's go, qualifications, mm -hmm. sound mind, not a bankrupt, uh, Bahamian citizen over the age of 21. And then you come to the table, are you a member of the Progressive Liberal Party? Secondly, do you therefore believe in the philosophy and ideology of the Progressive Liberal Party? So those are the basics. But apart from that, you have to also have a sense of what it is to be a public figure. A public figure is a very intense uh, vocation and activity. And you have to have broad shoulders and a thick skin. I've said it in a kind of funny way, like Felix Bethel might have said it, you have to be shameless. Mm. Because there's so much that's coming at you, you have to appreciate how to respond, what to respond to, when to respond, and when to be silent. So those are some of the qualities that we're looking for. We also want to be sure that it is across all the age demographics. So no one gets disqualified because you're 21, or disqualified because you're 80. The question is, what do you bring to the table, and are you relevant to the times? Mm -hmm. The other uh, aspect we want to look at is we want a cross-section of women and men, because, as you know, women are the majority of the electorate, and uh, they are not proportionally represented in the politics as far as it relates to the Senate 
and the House of Assembly. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to rectify that problem. Mm -hmm. And in that mix, we hope we get a cross-section of what the country is like, of all demographics from age, of both genders, and of course, uh, in the ideological uh, spectrum from you know, moderate to just left of center. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you uh, move uh, through the uh, country today um, and your candidates, I'm sure, the issues with respect to COVID-19 uh, are there, but what, what are you getting in terms of what the Bahamian people want? Well, there are, there are large, there, I would say a significant population, um, the polls show and our studies door-to-door -door show that seem disaffected generally with politics. I don't know if I'm going to vote, you know, both sides are the same. So this is the argument that we are going to have to be uh, working with and fighting with. And when they tell you that both sides are, are the same, what is your retort? Well, the retort is that they clearly are not, because if you look at the policy as they apply to uh, people who are in that middle class or a working class socioeconomic group, clearly they are worse off than they were four years ago. And that is the clearest explanation is that it is the policies of the government that have them in the position they are, notwithstanding the fact of COVID-19, notwithstanding the fact of the hurricane. The question is how are transfer payments, that is the social support systems, handled? And clearly they have not been handled effectively enough. So uh, I gave the example in Grand Bahama of the writing of police tic of tickets that is unconscionable to be taking place in a time of such high uh, economic uh, distress in the country, and people are tone deaf to it. What you know is if the progressive liberal party is in power and something happens which is adverse to the Bahamian interest, you know that you can get to any PLP politician and get that rectified. This group, you just can't get to them and they are fixed in their ways and they just proceed regardless. And then they help their friends and their friends are the rich and famous. They talk a good game about being for ordinary people, but ordinary people suffer while the rich gain. And you just have to see the, the largesse which has, uh, has resulted in uh, the revenues to the Simonet group, for example, one of whom is a member of parliament as opposed to ordinary contractors, who some of whom are not being today, and others of whom have had bus contracts, uh, building contracts, uh, park contracts, all canceled because they were associated with the previous regime. That's the free national movement. And they effect this with a vengeance and are unapologetic about it. And so, uh, what you say today is that the contrast is clear between the two governments uh, and the choice is clear that a government led by Philip Ray Davis is sensitive to the people of this country, believe that government is there to help those who can't help themselves, and believe that there is a public good, that wealth is for the public good and not for the individual coffers of, uh, of uh, wealthy citizens. You say these things because this is what you believe, uh, but uh, are the people connecting? Uh, are they, do they feel connected uh, to what you have just uh, outlined? It, it is a tough fight because there's so much cynicism and public opinion can be manipulated so easily. We are, for example, will be uh, starting a specific thrust both on the uh, legal front and uh, on the uh, public relations front because of the vast number of false uh, identities and pages which appear in social media that are designed to spread disinformation, excuse me, in the face of, uh, of the fact that the Progressive Liberal Party is on the way back. And so the mechanism that the FNM is trying to do to defeat this is just a lot of false information which has been spread and using the PLP symbol to do so. So we are seeking uh, ultimately through injunctive relief perhaps in the courts to stop the misuse of the PLP symbol and also where defamation exists and also through Facebook to get these pages taken down because this is certainly not good for our democracy. It has to be regulated and this false information has to stop. Uh, but I think that with the quality of the candidates, when the quality of the candidates, when the candidates are named and known and rolled out, 
I think people will be very impressed by the quality of these candidates and that they have the ability to take the country forward. These are not people who simply rolled out of bed one morning and say, I want to run for the House of Assembly. They bring to the table their experience, their individual consciences, and will carry the country forward uh, for the next decade. When do you think you would have, uh, you'd roll out your candidates? Uh, uh, because, you know, you have uh, a year plus at yes. the outside for uh, an, an election. We're almost done. Um, I had hoped that by the 1st of February uh, we would have made the deadline, but of course, you know how these things are, they're fluid, we're, mm. we're mainly through. Certainly there's an indicative list, so if the election is called tomorrow, I think most people would know who, who will be running, but the actual formal procedures have to take place, so quite soon. Now I want to make a distinction between uh, the question of choosing candidates and rolling out candidates. Mm. And you know, you have to be sensible how you roll out candidates yes. because it's a very expensive business and you want to go on a shorter formal campaign than a longer campaign for, very, for, for some obvious reasons yes. which, which perhaps should remain unstated. Is the Progressive Liberal Party ready for a general election? Uh, let's say a, the Prime Minister calls a snap election. Are you ready? We have an indicative list and we can go. You can tomorrow. go now? We can okay. go tomorrow. Let's take our final break yeah. and uh, we'll come right back. In the final segment of our program, Jones and Company, and uh, having a conversation today with Senator Fred Mitchell. Uh, Senator, let's say you, your party is successful in the next general election. What would be the priorities, uh, immediate priority or the priorities for the, uh, a new progressive liberal party government? Well, we have to be sure the pandemic is under control. Yeah. I mean, that, that clearly would be, and I think this is going to be with us for some time, so that would have to be the first priority. Mm -hmm. And to get rid of all the nuisances which we've talked about uh, in the earlier part of the program, mm -hmm. which are comp with these nuisances complicating people's lives unnecessarily, so get rid of all this red tape and nonsense that you know you have to you have to buy get a visa to travel within your own country get a visa to come inside your country this is all foolishness you have a problem with, with, with that a, a I, visa to travel to grand bahama it's just stupid it is just a loser it is just entirely stupid and you know what it, it, it is form of pettiness and the, the, what the accusation is now is we can't figure out where the revenue for this is going because it appears to me appears to many of us to be simply a measure which is just putting money, pouring money into the hands of private sector interests that are allied with the government. Mm -hmm. And this is a number of these sort of very clever rackets that the FNM government runs to get revenue into its coffers to run a campaign. So anyway, the pandemic is the first, first issue. But after that, it is money on the ground. How do you get U.S. dollars into this country and into the hands and pockets of those who are our ordinary citizens, so their lives can get back to some kind of normalcy. Nothing can happen unless there's some liquid cash, and the United States is seeing this, uh, which is why they're doing the special, special stimulus measures that they're doing now. So we need the equivalent of some form of stimulus. Then I would say the business community uh, and small business and medium enterprises businesses have to expect that we are hoping to, to set aside $250 million in a venture capital fund, which will be accessed uh, by small businesses and small and medium enterprises to be able to get people to start up businesses. And uh, we think those immediate measures will do much to get the wheels going. Uh, certainly, a lot has to also be done for Grand Bahama to get uh, the hotel open, to get some more business there. We have to fix the issues with the Grand Bahama Port Authority and the relationship to the government. Uh, that has to be done. And to get the government itself off the back of its citizens and allow them to be able to express themselves in business so we can get some money being made here. So the shorthand is the economy stupid, the economy stupid, the economy stupid. That's us. You know, the um, former Minister of Finance, uh, Peter Turnquist, had put in place a number of incentives um, and uh, uh, tax measures uh, to assist businesses. Uh, as some businesses have taken advantage of, uh, of it. Uh, didn't the government do something um, 
positive in that regard? On the face of it, but the complaint which has come back with access of all of these is we can't find one PLP who got any of this stuff, any of this, uh, any of this money. And if there if there is one progressive Liberal Party member who's gotten any any support from these, please give me a call because I'd like to know because we'd like to you know say congratulations to that person. So this has just turned out to be a partisan scheme as far as we can tell. So that's the issue with them. And then, of course, this Are you suggesting that um, in the Ministry of Finance uh, that uh, public servants uh, were told uh, just to give these advantages to, to FNMs? Uh, I can't say what was said to public servants. What I know is that we can't figure out, I'll say it the way I said it, we can't figure out one PLP who's gotten any support from it. So let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And so the results show in our view that this is a partisan scheme designed to get money into the hands of their partisans. And of course, that can't work because the moment you start using parochial uh, choices in order to give out government uh, support, you're running yourself into problems because uh, many people will be left out of the system. What you need is a fair, rational, and certain system on a first-come, first-served basis. Mm -hmm. And that's what we would uh, seek to implement. Now, with regard to the licensing issues, um, you know, there is a problem with the use of digital platforms in the Bahamas. Breaks down half the time, doesn't work. Uh, it's a nightmare. You can't get anyone on the phone. You can't physically go into the place. And so government services need, need a lot to be designed. The FNM administration talks a good game on these issues. In fact, they're short on delivery. And as I said uh, to uh, Carl Bethel, who was uh, boasting that, or, or Quasi Thompson, who was boasting he, or criticizing the PLP, saying the PLP talks, but it doesn't deliver. And I said, I don't agree with you there, because you can't uh, uh, put any equivalence between the free national movement and the, and the PLP in terms of what's been contributed to this country. Even if you look at the last five years, despite all the propaganda, Bahama, University of the Bahamas, National Health Service, FAMSI, the social support systems, all put in place by the Progressive Liberal Party. In those five years, what has the FNM done? But they're, they're maintenance people, mechanics. No, they can't invent anything. They, and so I said, that's the PLP. There's no, you cannot, uh, Andrew Allen said this, you cannot equate in any way, shape, or form the contribution of the PLP to the FNM or the FNM to the PLP. You cannot do so. They're just disproportionate. Uh, the PLP is up here, the FNM is somewhere down there. So that's that. So um, that, 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 is, that is the issue with those. So the, I was talking about the, the digital platforms and the difficulty of delivery of service. And then I said to Carl, I said, look, you know, what you fellas are expert at is you come in, you meet something which is not broken, you break it, then you fix it. And that's exactly what they're doing now. From they came in, met the revenue enhancement unit in place, said it was useful, and then found out it was working all the time, recreated it, and then make a big announcement saying the FNM has a revenue enhancement unit. Of course, but you didn't, you know. That, that's, that's what they're expert at. And uh, we're going to keep calling them out as this campaign goes on, calling them out over and over and over again about the, about the great fraud which they perpetrated on this population in 2017, and they have not been able to deliver. Since um, you were last on this program, uh, we have seen a new Minister of Finance in the person of the Prime Minister, a new Minister of State, uh, Mr. Crazy Thompson, the departure of Mr. Turnquest. Um, in terms of the management of our fiscal affairs where we are today, uh, what do you say? Well, you know, i just give you one example. $150 million and counting on a hotel in Grand Bahama, which they bought at an overvalue and allowed the company that sold it to get away with the insurance money plus the overvalue which they paid. There were 400 people working in the hotel at the time they took the hotel over. They said that they bought the hotel to save jobs and create jobs. Today, there's no one working at the hotel. They've spent $150 million plus, you know, within, uh, when you add the 65 and the maintenance. So they have nothing to show uh, a year later. Uh, there's a public disagreement 
the, of the company that owns the hotel and the Minister of Tourism about whether it's a good deal or a bad deal, whether he is in the negotiations or he isn't in the negotiations. And the person who is the granddaddy who oversees all of this is the most honorable prime minister. Fiasco, fiasco. And so that should tell you what we are looking at as a minister, as a minister of finance and uh, the bureaucracy which he's put in place with this other layer with uh, Senator Kwesi Thompson. Is Senator Crazy Thompson up to it? Um, you know, I said to him, uh, and, and I always tease him about this, I said, you know, you're the best spokesman that the FNM has. You know, he speaks well, uh, puts a good argument. Unfortunately, he's got a bad product, and I don't believe a word he says. But, you know, he's a good spokesperson. <laughs> um, you know, uh, there is a minister of finance, and there, uh, you know, the bureaucracy is there. I am given to understand that a former financial secretary of the Bahamas is still on the government's payroll. Yes, I understand so. What, uh, what, what, what is the opposition doing about that? Um, well, I, I'm not sure we can do anything about it. The man has a, has, a, has a case which is before the courts, and so everything has come ground to a halt. But there should be, there should be a substantive, uh, not an acting financial secretary. And doesn't seem to be any reason why the one who is, the who is, in fact, the financial secretary shouldn't be the financial secretary. Mm -hmm. um, as we wind up our program, you know, I, I, I'm leaving this question for the last. I should have asked you at the, uh, when we were talking about COVID-19. The leader of the opposition uh, in the House of Assembly talked about a breach uh, of the Minister of Finance or the Prime Minister with respect to reporting on financial when he asked for emergency order. Um, there are people in the opposition who claim that he is in breach. Um, is he really? Uh, looking at the face of the law, it provides that he is supposed to, within six weeks of the expiry, he's supposed to present information about various aspects of what they did, including the contractors and the money spent. He has not done so. And because he hasn't done so, what, what should happen? That, that, that leads to a breach. There is a, in, in the orders, there is a penalty of $10,000, of a $10,000 fine in the jail. So who's going to bring the charge against him? Well, I was listening very closely to the Attorney General because he had plenty to say about everything, everything, everything except that. And so next time, at the Senate, we shall be pressing him again, a full court press on this. Are you going to disclose or are you going to do your job as Attorney General? Yes, but um, you, you, you don't expect anyone to bring a charge against the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance for not disclosing um, uh, something under the law, do you? What I expect the Prime Minister to do is to follow the law. And he's always preaching to people about following the law. He's always barking at younger people and barking at uh, the public because they didn't wear a mask, because they didn't have, you know, charging $250, $500 here and there. Well, you know, physician, heal thyself. And if he doesn't follow the law? Then the law should follow him and the consequences ought to ensue. Senator Mitchell, thank you very much. Thank great, you for being great. here today. It's a pleasure to be here. I wish Say hello to God for Ineos. Yes, um, he, he's on a radio with me every weekday, and yeah. uh, he's going to soon join us, uh, I guess, when he gets the vaccine. Yes, right. <laughs> right. Thank you very no, much. Uh, thank you for listening to our program. Good evening, everyone.